Good job, Palm. So what you see here is the unburying of a hydrokinetic turbine built by New Energy Corporation from Canada that converts power generated from a spinning turbine that's spun by the water into electricity. Our objective for this project is to find suitable pressure sensors that can be mounted to the blades on this hydrokinetic turbine to allow us to find the pressure differential across the blades while the blade is moving underwater. There are several reasons for trying to find the pressure change across a hydrofoil blade. Some of them include trying to optimize blade efficiencies by using pressure information. One that pertains more to Alaska is the Anadromous Fish Act AS 16.05.871 by the Alaska Department of Fish and Game. It states that to construct a hydraulic project or use, divert, obstruct, pollute, or change the natural flow or bed of water, approval is required. The pressure information across a blade is some of the necessary information required by the Alaska Department of Fish and Game. They require this type of information because it is harmful for fish as the pressure change can be lethal towards the fish that are passing through it. Uh, you, should, you might want to straighten that yeah, out too. So with the objective of trying to find suitable pressure Look, sensors like for these the blades, the we had to devise a testing method that would allow us to test the validity of our data obtained by pressure sensors that we feel are suitable for this turbine. Originally we wanted to test the whole turbine in a body of water, but this proved to be too complicated as this turbine was oversized and overweight for our application. Eight feet, three inches. When testing the whole turbine was out of the equation, we decided to look at alternative methods that would allow us to test a single blade underwater. Shown here is a cart that we were thinking of testing a single blade vertically. The cart would have been pushed parallel to the body of water, but this proved to be too complicated as fabrication was extensive, so we looked at alternative methods. Our end result for a testing apparatus used this life raft with an apparatus mounted to the back of the life raft where we could change the angle of attack of a hydrofoil blade. We brainstormed several ideas for different types of pressure sensors, and ultimately we chose the FSR402, which is a force sensing resistor. We were able to convert this force into a pressure reading that ultimately gave us the data that we wanted to obtain. Our apparatus that was mounted to the rear of the life raft was completely designed in SOLIDWORKS. The discs shown on the left and right allowed us to pivot this blade from 0 to 90 degrees angle of attack. The way the discs were set up, if we needed to, we could actually test at a full 360 degrees. The discs were manufactured at the machine shop at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. After manufacturing, they were welded to a piece of flat aluminum stock. The discs were welded to the upper portion of the testing apparatus, which was then mounted to a transom board cut to fit the engine mounts on the life raft. We mounted the other discs to vertical members attached to the lower portion of the testing apparatus so the blade could actually pivot. Since we only had two vertical members on it, we had to create a third member that would allow us to replicate the actual setup of the turbine since it has three support structures mounted to the blade. The upper and lower half of the testing apparatus were bolted together with two bolts in each side of the discs. As you can see here, we have two half-inch bolts on each disc. This is John soldering our sensor. We soldered some extra wire to the pin ends of the FSR402 sensors, so we would have a little bit extra wire to play around with when we were mounting the sensors to the blade. The extra wiring that was soldered to these pin connector ends were butt connected to our cable wire which ran into the life raft. After getting our wires soldered and butt connected together, we mounted into the blade with some good old epoxy. We purposely marked the discs with red marker at 0, 30, 60, and 90 degrees angle of attack so it would be easy to identify the angles of attack underwater. Portions that weren't held together by welding were held together with regular nuts and bolts. Shown here is the vertical member mounted to the horizontal blade. We had to put some shims under there to ensure that we got the exact angles of attack that we wanted. After epoxying our sensors, we had our cable wire run up the center beam and we zip tied it to this beam. These wires ran to our data acquisition system that had four channels and it had four wires for each channel. 
one high, one low, and two excitation wires for each channel that ran to each sensor. Our DAQ was mounted inside of our raft where it was plugged into a computer via USB. To solve our issue of trying to obtain a constant velocity, we ended up using a stationary bike that we removed the rear tire off of and were able to retract the cord that pulled the raft into this wheel. A wireless speedometer was mounted to the one of the spokes of the wheel that allowed us to measure in miles per hour the velocity of the wheel that we were able to convert into meters per second. We assembled our whole apparatus at the University of Alaska swimming pool where we inflated our raft and tested our sensors with an ohm meter before we submerged them underwater. No, no, it's on the side. Yep. We had a few snags setting up our testing equipment, but ultimately we were able to get our bike to retract correctly. We got our team member who was going to be on the raft all situated with the testing equipment and we were ready to test. We reserved four hours for the swimming pool, and that gave us just enough time to test five trials for each angle of attack. See? Yeah. Go. After doing five runs for the first angle of attack, we had to change our angle of attack to the next set. I am loosening the four nuts and bolts, two on each side, that basically allows us to swing this blade to the end uh, here. And then I'm going to tighten them, and then we're going to do five runs. After completing our testing, we took all of our obtained data and we began to put them through a series of equations, some of them coming from a calibration curve we received for these particular sensors. The sensors outputted ohms, which we converted to pascals and were able to calculate a differential pressure. We found theoretical pressures with a flow simulation program in SOLIDWORKS. We averaged each angle of attack's experimental data and we also found the average velocity for those angles of attack. Here's a comparison of a theoretical plot shown in red compared to our blue experimental plot. The deviation from our theoretical change in pressure can be attributed to experimental error associated with our constant velocity mechanism as well as some of our equipment. After testing we took a look at our results and noticed that for 60 and 90 degrees angle of attack our values were much higher than we expected. Um, we believe only one or two of those runs were actually good and the rest were just error, which means that our sensors malfunctioned at 60 and 90 degrees. When we put all four of them into the pool, they were working, and then about halfway through our trial, they stopped working, and this was in a controlled environment. Now, if we were going to use these sensors out in the, you know, uncontrolled environment, like in the river or any body of water where, there's, where it's flowing, then these sensors would not hold up to anything because they're way too fragile and they would just break. So we would recommend not using these for this kind of application. So what can we do to remedy the situation? If you're still going to use piezo-resistive force sensing resistors, then you're going to have to do one thing, and that is get them custom made. By custom made, I mean the company will have to create sensors that are waterproof and more durable that can last in Alaskan waterways. We would like to give a special thanks to our sponsors, the Alaska Center for Energy and Power and the Alaska Hydrokinetic Energy Research Center, as well as here at UAF, Dr. Rourke Peterson and Eric Johansson and Joe Mikowski at the Machine Shop, as well as Dutton's Aircraft Sheet Metal and Repair Shop for letting us work there.